Mr. President, I rise today in support of the nomination of Judge Neil Gorsuch for the Supreme Court of the United States. Last week, the Judiciary Committee, on which I served, held a week-long series of hearings concerning Judge Gorsuch's nomination. After listening to the judge's flawless testimony, after listening to him answer questions from my colleagues for days on end, I'm even more convinced than ever that he is exactly the kind of jurist we need on the Supreme Court of the United States. I want to briefly explain my support for the judge and then respond to some of the criticisms that have been leveled against him. First and foremost, Judge Gorsuch understands the proper and necessarily limited role of the judiciary in our constitutional republic. Last week, over and over again, Judge Gorsuch affirmed, even against great criticism, criticism that at times uh, can be difficult to understand in its entirety, but uh, responded time and time again uh, to criticisms by pointing out that it's his job as a judge to interpret and apply the law and not to make it, not to establish policy, but to apply that policy which has already been placed into law by the legislative branch. When you're reading law, the text matter. Our, our laws consist of words, and each word matters. And if the law leads to an uncomfortable outcome for the parties, for politicians, for anyone else in our society, then it's our job as a Congress, or if it's a state law at issue, it's the job of the state legislature to get the policy right, to fix the policy problem at issue. The judge's job is to go where the law leads the judge, not to correct the law. Over and over again, Judge Gorsuch affirmed the importance of precedent in our system. It's clearly a topic that he takes very seriously, having co-authored a treatise on that very subject. And while precedent is not always absolute, insofar as you've got a, a clear conflict with the text, Judge Gorsuch testified that you start with the, quote, heavy presumption in favor of precedent, close quote. He described precedent as the anchor of the law. And over and over, Judge Gorsuch explained that judges are not partisans in robes. No, they're different. They're different from politicians. They're meaningfully different than the politicians who make the laws or the politicians uh, in the executive branch who enforce and execute the laws. They are unfailingly independent when they're doing their jobs right. They're devoted to the rule of law. And they do their best to decide cases on the basis of the law and the facts, rather than on the basis of achieving whatever outcome they or others might desire. Now, some of my colleagues' view of Judge Gorsuch's record uh, is different, and I, I want to address some of their concerns. First, some of my colleagues have questioned the independence of Judge Gorsuch, his ability to exercise judicial independence. This is a very serious accusation. In fact, it's probably one of the worst things you can say about a judge. So my colleagues who have raised this criticism would need to back that up against something. If you're going to raise a really serious accusation against someone, as you are whenever you're uh, calling into question a judge's independence, you've got to be able to back it up. So let's look at that. Can they back it up? I, I, I don't think so. I, in fact, I'm quite certain they can't because they haven't. The argument boils down to the complaint that Judge Gorsuch hasn't sufficiently criticized President Trump's comments about judges. But here's what Judge Gorsuch said about this topic last week. And he said this in response to questions raised by Senator Blumenthal on the Judiciary Committee. He said, quote, Senator, I care deeply about the independence of the judiciary. I cannot talk about the specific cases or controversies that might come before me, and I cannot get involved in politics. Judge Gorsuch continued, but, Senator, when you attack the integrity or honesty or independence of a judge, their motives, as we sometimes hear, Senator, I know the men and women of the federal judiciary, a lot of them. I know how hard their job is, how much they often give up to do it. 
the difficult circumstances in which they do it. It's a lonely job too, and I'm not asking for crocodile tears or anything like that. I'm just saying I know these people, and I know how decent they are, and when anyone criticizes the honesty or integrity, the motives of a federal judge, well, I find that disheartening. I find that demoralizing because I know the truth. Senator Blumenthal then asked Judge Gorsuch whether when he said anyone that applied to the, pres to the President of the United States. Judge Gorsuch responded simply, anyone is anyone. It's true that Judge Gorsuch didn't use the magic words, I disagree with press President Trump. But he can't get involved in politics. He said here what he can say. In fact, he said all he can say in this context. Moreover, here are some additional parts of Judge Gorsuch's testimony, which shed light on this issue. From Tuesday, quote, I have no difficulty ruling against or for any party other than based on what the law and the facts in the particular case require. And I'm heartened by the support I've received from people who recognize that there's no such thing as a Republican judge or a Democratic judge. We just have judges in this country, close quote. From Wednesday, he said, quote, I do not see Republican judges and I do not see Democrat judges. I see judges, close quote. So I think any fair-minded person looking at this would have to agree that Judge Gorsuch's feelings about judicial independence in cases before the federal judiciary are very clear. And to my colleagues who might see the issue differently, I would ask simply, what should Judge Gorsuch have said without getting involved in politics, without miring himself in a debate that is within the political branches of government, and therefore within the political rather than the judicial interpretive arena. Second, some of my colleagues allege that Judge Gorsuch is somehow out of the mainstream. But consider these facts. Judge Gorsuch has decided roughly 2,700 cases. His decisions have been unanimous 97% of the time. Keep in mind that he is an appellate judge. He sits on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit. And appellate judges never sit alone in that capacity. They sit in panels, normally in panels of three, sometimes in panels of a dozen or so when they sit and bank. 97% of the time, all of the judges with whom Judge Gorsuch sits in any case agree, agree with whatever decision he reaches. He's in the majority 99% of the time. He's about as likely to dissent from a Republican appointed judge as a Democratic appointed judge. He's been reversed twice and in both cases he was following circuit precedent. Now I want to make clear there's nothing wrong with a judge who dissents more than this. In fact in many instances dissents are necessary. In many instances a dissent can be useful, even indispensable. There are judges out there who dissent more than this, and there wouldn't be anything wrong with Judge Gorsuch if he dissented any more. My point is, of all the arguments you can make against Judge Gorsuch, this is not a fair characterization. To say that he is out of the mainstream simply runs against mathematics. It runs against the, uh, the, the, the bold statistics on their very face, which contradict this characterization. Some of my colleagues respond that only a handful of cherry-picked cases matter. If you watched the hearing last week, you might recognize the names of some of these cases. They include Trans Am Trucking, Wong, Luke P, Hobby Lobby. What I find revealing is that my colleagues never mount much of a legal argument against any of these decisions. No, you're not going to find quibbling with the statutory construction in these cases. They don't parse the statutes at issue and then explain where it is that Judge Gorsuch somehow got it wrong, somehow departed from what the law actually says. No, they're looking at outcomes. They think Judge Gorsuch should have bent the law in order to go where they think the law should go. They want judges who have the right approach in mind, the right outcome in mind, to decide the case according to what outcome they desire. I simply flatly disagree with this view of judging. It is a view, frankly, that's way out of the mainstream in American law. 
To say it's out of the mainstream in American law, I, I don't mean out of the uh, Republican mainstream or the conservative mainstream, the mainstream uh, uh, among members of the Federalist Society. No, I, I'm talking about uh, rank and file practitioners of the law, jurists from every conceivable point along the political and ideological spectrum. It, th this is just not something that a judge would ever want to admit to doing. Certainly never anything a judge would aspire to do. To choose an outcome and say, I'm going to reach that outcome, and I don't really care that the law doesn't really authorize me to do it. I'm just going to do it because I think in some abstract sense, uh, that outcome would uh, achieve a greater degree of fairness than what the law actually requires me to do. Third, I'm distressed by a lot of the rhetoric that we heard during the confirmation hearing last week. Rhetoric that I expect to continue and even mount over the next 10 days or so. One of my colleagues last week actually went so far as to des describe the Supreme Court of the United States as a, quote, instrument of the Republican Party. Other colleagues have complained about the so-called dark money uh, campaign to support Judge Gorsuch's nomination. And still other colleagues complain that President Trump or Steve Bannon or Reince Priebus or, or others are enthusiastic about Judge Gorsuch's nomination, as if the fact that someone is supported by someone they don't like means that the person in question is not qualified. This is unfair to Judge Gorsuch. Judge Gorsuch didn't decide Citizens United. He didn't decide Hobby Lobby or any other case that my colleagues dislike. And he made clear in no uncertain terms that no one speaks on his behalf but him. Now, they may dislike some of the cases in which he authored opinions. But again, in those cases, they're not quibbling with the way that he interpreted the law. No one has attacked his interpretation of the statute, his approach to statutory construction. They're quibbling with the outcome, quibbling with the fact that they wish it had turned out differently on policy grounds, policy grounds that have everything to do with the policy-making arms of the government and not with the jurisprudential arm of the government. Even worse, these types of statements are damaging to our judiciary. If you don't like a judicial decision, engage in the decision on its own terms. Engage in a discussion of how that decision turned out wrong, where it is that it departed from what the law requires. Make a legal argument, in other words. The courts announce reasons for their decisions. There's plenty of material to dig into. But don't impugn the judge's motives or independence. This is especially harmful when you impugn the judge's motives without actually getting into what the judge did or what the law says and explaining how those two things diverge. Don't accuse the Supreme Court of functioning as an instrument of the Republican Party. In fact, you might as well call someone a so-called judge in a case where you disagree with the outcome. In fact, calling someone a so-called judge is probably no worse than calling the Supreme Court of the United States an instrument of the Republican Party. Finally, I want to talk about the filibuster. The minority leader has urged his colleagues to filibuster. The minority whip has announced he will filibuster. Only two Democrats have said they will vote yes on cloture, so here we are. I'd ask my colleagues, if Neil Gorsuch can't get 60 votes for cloture, which Republican nominee can? Some of my colleagues have argued that if a nominee can't get 60 votes, the president should find a new nominee. I asked my colleagues, was that the standard for several of President Obama's nominees to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit? Well, yeah, it was. Under Rule 22, that was the standard. That was the standard until in November of 2013, the Democrats in the Senate went nuclear, and they created new precedent taking that threshold down from 60, by precedent, to 51. Through going nuclear, this is the result they achieved. 
Their analysis in its entirety went in this direction. Their analysis nukes the executive filibuster. It nuked the filibuster on the executive calendar. Interestingly, although some were insisting at the time and went down to the floor to explain at the time, they didn't intend for this to extend to Supreme Court nominees. When everyone thought Hillary Clinton would be president, Harry Reid admitted that the Democrats would extend this same precedent through which the Democrats had nuked the executive filibuster to Supreme Court nominees. So, look, I, I, I work with my colleagues on the other side of the aisle on a great number of important issues, issues that are very important to me, issues like criminal justice reform, reform of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, uh, reform of the Electronic Communications Privacy Act of 1986, which is badly in need of reform, and a number of uh, other issues, many of which involve privacy protections. These are A-plus legislative priorities for me. Nothing else is more important, and I stand ready to reform uh, the law uh, whenever I see the need to do so, and will continue to work with my Democratic colleagues. But I want to be clear that um, as we approach this discussion, unilateral disarmament doesn't work. I hope the Democrats reserve, uh, reverse course and do not filibuster this nominee. But if, if they do, I'm confident Judge Gorsuch will be confirmed. Thank you. Mr. President.